Hi, I'm John, the MedPot Engineer Termel, and this is my report on the hearing at Ontario's highest court of appeal before Justice Doherty. And after a short recap with the people and supporters who showed up, I'll be reading the transcript from my audio tape notes. Correct. So we were at the Ontario Court of Appeal today, November the 2nd where 13 people filed applications for extensions of time to be able to file appeals against their old convictions because of the Smith decision at the Supreme Court of Canada that found that there was a worse bad exemption than was found in 2003 where they had to let everybody go for two years because there's no offense when there's a bad exemption. Well, the judge who made those rulings, Judge Doherty, was on the, on the bench today. So I got to say, your decision said it's a bad exemption. And your decision quashed the kids' charges. And now we want you to use the same rationale to quash ours. Now, their big deal was that I'd already filed a notice of appeal. But there are a bunch of people here who have not which meant that he has to deal with both of us. He might be able to throw me out because I've already been through there once and he said there must be finality. But I said, look, it, if you're gonna say it was a bogus conviction for these guys because they didn't lose once before, that ain't fair for me. And he said, well, that's the way it works. It's declared unconstitutional, but they're still gonna keep you in jail. And I said, well, that's not just, and it shouldn't be. So anyway, we're waiting to find out. The judge reserved his decision, and he said he'll hand it down within a day or two. Okay, so that's it. Justice Doherty, who was the lead judge in Hitzig and JP, and uh, Hitzig, JP, and Termel back in 03, was today's judge. Nobody should know more how it works, because he worked it once before. Hi, this is a reading of the transcript of my tape notes from yesterday's hearing at the Ontario Court of Appeal before Justice Doherty for my application for an extension of time to file a notice of appeal against my 2006 conviction for my 2003 bust on Parliament Hill with seven pounds of marijuana for which I was sentenced to 100 hours playing my accordion in old folks' homes, but still have the criminal record. And I, with 12 other people, have applied to use the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Smith as the bad exemption that should allow us to have our charges, our appeals, because there should be no offense at the time we were busted. So this is the transcript of the hearing. So... All right, it was actually fortuitous that Justice Doherty, who headed up both the JP and the Hitzig Court of Appeal panels in 2003, was presiding. I didn't have to explain anything much. We were the only two who knew everything. Even though I'd been brutal on him at the time, there was no rancor while heading the panel on the Dragon's Den Appeal a few years ago. When CBC asked for 5,500 court costs, he said too much, 3,500. Of course, I never paid, they never chased, but it was appreciated. He'd have never done that if my appeal was a waste of time. So when I informed him I'd be taping for my records, he wondered why I was telling him that, since I'd always tape my hearings before him without asking for permission. So I said, because the new protocol on audio recording of March the 31st, 2013, required I alert the judge. Well, you still don't need my permission. No, I just have to alert you I've turned it on, which I've done. So he said, am I right that your case and the other 12 raised the same issue? Yes, they raised the same card in our defense. Now at that point, he asked the other applicants to identify themselves, and only Bella Becky and I were there. I explained they're from disparate areas of Ontario and basically hope that whatever I get, they get too. Judge, certainly you can argue your motion, but not for anyone else. I could have mentioned that I argued for the Magnificent Seven in the Ontario Court of Appeal in 2012, and I wasn't even one of the appellants, but not the issue. Um, well, I said, well, if it works for me, it'll work for them. 
so you purport to only argue your motion. I only need to convince you on one, because it's a general principle, yes. So the judge said, Mr. Beck, will you ask me to apply what Mr. Termel says? Yes, he's extensively familiar with my case. Okay, well, when Mr. Termel's finished, I'll let you add anything you want. Mr. Termel, I have an application for extension of time and an affidavit. That appears to be the totality of what I have. Correct. The conviction you seek an extension of time upon has already been the subject of an appeal in this court, which was dismissed, and leave to appeal was denied. Under different grounds, yes. But the same conviction, yes. The first thing I have to hear you on is what authority is there for me to hear any motion for an extension of time in respect of an appeal when the appeal's already been dismissed before? Well, the same authority that your Hitzig court used to then, in the JP case, your JP court used to quash JP's charges, JP being the initials of a youth. Well, he said, this court has dismissed your appeal from this conviction. On what basis do you get to launch a new appeal to this court when this court's dismissed your appeal? Well, I said, on the basis of the Smith decision at the Supreme Court of Canada in June of this year. So your position is, every time you get a new ground of appeal, you can simply reboot the old appeal. Yes, Parker Hidson created a two-year period of bad exemption, no offense, with the 4,000 charges dropped. And now Parker Smith creates a similar retrospective period of invalidation, and my charge was in there. It's the same analogy using the Smith decision, except the Smith decision was a lot worse than your Hitzig decision. The Hitzig flaws in the exemption were merely supply flaws, growers to gardens. But now the Supreme Court has said stopping people from making oil to treat their tumors is even worse. I'm back saying that if you found a bad exemption meant no offense for JP in 2003, well then a bad exemption from Smith means no offense for me in 2015, because that's just when they found out. I have a right to go erase a bogus conviction, is all I'm arguing. And that is my whole case, given you're so familiar with our background. Thank you, my lord. Judge. A second point I want to raise with you, and I appreciate you being as succinct as you were. We know there are all kinds of cases from the Supreme Court of Canada that say, if your case is out of the system in the sense that you've exhausted your appeals, and there's a subsequent decision on a constitutional point in your favor, if the case is out of the system, you can't rely on it. The Supreme Court said for all kinds of people were in jail on constructive murder charges for the rest of their lives and constructive murder was declared unconstitutional. They tried to launch appeals. The Supreme Court of Canada said, sorry, you're out of the system. You just have to stay in jail. Even though while you're in jail, the law's been declared unconstitutional. What makes your case different than that? Whoa, tough, 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 tough. Here I slipped. I should have pointed out that murder was a God-given tort against a victim, while prohibition was a parliament-given tort with no victim. But given the awesome challenge of those precedents, I had, to, from the Supreme Court, he said they're coming, I had to rely only on the failure of justice for me. So I said, yeah, we're both examples of injustice. Why should I suffer a bogus conviction when your court found a bad exemption when JP was charged meant there was no offense? Now the Supreme Court found there was a bad exemption when I was charged. And because other arguments lost in the past should not foreclose on my chance, especially when a whole bunch of these other appellants do not have a previous appeal to hinder them and are simply saying, I didn't know what the Smith decision was going to say when I pleaded guilty or was convicted in the past. But now that I know, I'm going to use the Parker Hitzig rationale for Parker Smith now. And that means everybody. If they drop 4,000 charges in the last Beano period, they're going to have to drop a whole bunch more again. So we're back exactly to the same situation as in 2003, when you had to quash JP's charges because your own Hitzig ruling had found that there'd been a bad exemption when he was charged. And the JP court used the latest Hitzig precedent not raised at trial. It popped up right at the appeal. Well, now, the... The Supreme Court of Canada, higher than your ruling, 
has found an even worse exemption. Misuse rather than misapply, where people actually die. You can count the corpses. You can't put dried blood on a tumor. It's got to be oil. And that was banned for 14 years. So the Smith decision at the Supreme Court offers us another bad exemption. And the Parker decision said there's no offense unless you have a working exemption. And your own JP decision lays that ethos out a half a dozen times. Well, the Supreme Court just found another worse exemption, and I'm calling on your court to give me the same benefit you gave JP, which was when there's no offense, when there's a bad exemption. Whether I appealed in the past on other grounds or not, because you'll, you're still going to have to deal with the other ones who didn't. And if there was no offense for them, because it does deal back with, for JP, then the only issue is why should my previous conviction on other grounds preclude me from the same benefit that these other people are all seeking? Judge says, I take it even though people who've not been in the subject of a prior appeal, they're out of the system in the sense that they don't have an outstanding appeal now. Well, they filed applications for extension of the time. Well, Judge, they don't have an outstanding appeal. They're trying to get in the door. Yeah, correct. But there are some who did. Now, you can't get into the door based on changes in the law after you were out of the system. And I say, well, that's not fair. We have to argue that. Well, Judge, well, there are other concerns. Finality. Oh, I don't want to start arguing jurisprudence 101. Okay, I said. So the arguments apply to the others who don't have previous appeal. but And they are asking to have their chance to file an application for their first appeal late because they didn't know about Smith when they ended up being charged and were convicted. Same argument for them, but they don't have the predicament of a previous appeal as I do. All right, Mr. Becky, do you have anything to add? No, not really. I'm just a man convicted of a crime that the Supreme Court ruled in June that those charges, those laws should not have existed at the time I was arrested and charged and subsequently convicted two years later. And I'm just asking for the chance to have this overturned based on what the Supreme Court stated, that if the law didn't exist at the time, I should not have been charged with such an offense. I'm not saying that positive thing, but it was all medicinal like everyone else here. Well, the judge, it certainly seems fair to say that you were a little ahead on the cultural curve. <laughs> Did you appeal your conviction? Don't forget, you got busted with 10 pounds, okay? Lots of people with medicinal license have a right to 10 pounds. No, sir, a deal was struck between myself and the Crown Attorney after I had cross-examined the detectives on the charges. So you never appealed. Did you file an affidavit? Yes, I was convicted in 2013. Since then, I've been asking for extensions of time to pay the $2,000 fine, which means he's still in the system. Judge, what's the Crown say about this? Uh, I missed his name. You are already made the points about the finality of these matters. Mr. Turmel always makes the same argument to this court. Every time there's new jurisprudence on marijuana, there are cases, Judge said, Mr. Turmel and I go back to arguing about bank interest rates. That's about 30 years ago. This is a change for me. Crown, first, what this court said in Parker 2011 was that a finding of invalidity, a fresh finding of invalidity, is not a revival of the old Parker 2000 finding of invalidity. The fresh finding of invalidity doesn't have the tone scope and it doesn't have the separate like Parker 2000. And Smith, which is at tab six, and the judge says, I don't have it. But I read Smith last night, so go ahead. Crown said, well, Smith very precisely says that section four and five are of no force and effect to the extent that they prohibit a person with a medical authorization from possessing derivatives. And Mr. Turmel wants that declaration to invalidate the entire prohibition. The SEC actually says that the offense provisions of the CDSA should not be struck out in their entirety. Smith expressly does not invalidate the entire prohibition, not retrospectively and certainly not retroactively. The proposed appeal has no prospect of success over and above the finality this court made reference to. Judge, now I can deal with Mr. Becky and Mr. Turmel, but how about the others? I would ask that they be dismissed. Because they aren't here, so, because they aren't here, Okay, Mr. Turmel, any reply bearing in mind I can remember what you've already said. Anything to add? Well, the Crown said Smith did not strike the prohibitions in the CDSA. Well, neither did Hitzig. 
Hence, they just struck down the flaws in the MMAR, as Smith just struck down the flaws in the MMAR, and at no point did you comment in Hitzig on the CDSA, in Hitzig or in Smith, like you said. But then JP used your Hitzig declaration to quash his criminal charge. And we have a whole bunch of motions below eight in Ontario and Quebec on Smith Dino quash motions. So you have 13 of us here looking to overturn our convictions and a whole bunch of new quash motions arising below, which I forestalled organizing, waiting to see what happens here because Ontario should be heard first. JP and McCready are Ontario decisions. So just as JP, who wasn't sick, didn't have an exemption, used your Hitzig declaration to beat his charge, I don't have to be sick, and the Smith decision doesn't have to say the CDSA is flawed, the Hitzig decision didn't. But you did in JP, and you can in Termel or in Bella Beck. That's my only point. Thank you. Jerry. Is your conviction that the subject of the February 23rd, 27, and 2007 endorsement, the appeal from the conviction of Justice Benaji. Yes. Okay, thank you for your submissions. I'll deal with this at some time today, but I want to carry on with other people. So you'll be advised of my decision within a day or so. Thank you. Bye.